The crisis has affected uh, education in different forms and different ways, but I think it's very important to say that we had the crisis before the crisis. The learning crisis predated the COVID. We had already more than 280 uh, young people who, were, who dropped out or who didn't access to education. We had more than 770 million people who were illiterate. The COVID has uh, amplified some of these uh, aspects. First of all, we had 1.6 billion learners who were out of uh, education for several months. We had people who were not connected to internet and didn't have opportunity to learn. But most probably the most important and the most negative impact is about the learning losses that uh, will impact the learning and the future of uh, education and the future of the work of many people who have suffered from this crisis. In addition to education, we have a crisis of well-being. We had people who are affected by anxiety, by uh, issues related to uh, violence at home, by early marriage, and sometimes even early uh, work. And uh, I would say, most importantly, this has impacted everybody on earth, but it, has, it is an equal. The learning losses are unequal across the countries. Learning losses are unequal within the same country across the different socioeconomic backgrounds. I think usually uh, countries will borrow policies from each other and usually it's the developing economies that will borrow the models from uh, the developed economies. Take, for example, a uh, dual system uh, that countries will uh, borrow from, from Germany. Take, for example, uh, colleges, uh, education that countries will, will borrow from the US. But in the crisis, everybody was faced with the same challenge. And developing economies or developed economies will had to learn from each other. What was important for the international cooperation is that there was this feeling that countries have to come together, had to share uh, experience and expertise, had to learn from each other. And it's amazing to give you an example. Uh, in the past, to organize a, a large international meeting of ministers, it will take us months, if not years. In two weeks, we organized an international ministerial meeting of education, and we had more than 70 ministers around the table. That's an example of how the crisis has impacted the international cooperation in terms of the celerity, but also in terms of the interest to share knowledge, to share expertise, but also to learn from each other. UNESCO has moved very fast. We had three actions that we have taken. One, acting as a convening power, and we, we, we organized a ministerial meeting. We launched a global education coalition that leveraged the potential of UN organization, private sector, civil society, research institution, and media. But we also organized a wide range of webinars for capacity building on issues that member states had to face and had to solve now and here. For example, we organized a meeting on how you organize high-stake exams, how you deal with teacher training, how you organize vocational training. And we were accompanying member states to cope with the COVID crisis and to offer them the resources, the peer learning, the platform to exchange and to learn together. UNESCO was acting based on demand from member states. Here is a concrete example. Senegal had a platform that was not operating, had teachers that were not trained to engage in remote learning and had learners who had problems of connectivity and access to internet because of the, uh, the challenge in terms of infrastructure, but also because of the cost of access to, in to internet. What UNESCO has done through the Global Education Coalition is to mobilize a partner like Microsoft to develop uh, the, the uh, teachers' capacities to engage in the platform. And we enrolled in a few weeks half a million learners in the, the platform that the government had already, but we helped them operating it. We have trained teachers on digital skills. We have worked with Orange to zero rate access to education, and that helped learners and teachers access to the platform, access to education resources for free. That's what we have been operating through Global Co Education Coalition. We have responded to a challenge of a member state. Second, for the first time, we had Microsoft working with uh, a, an organization like Orange, working with an organization like UNESCO, working with the government. So this innovative collaboration is something new that came through a response to the COVID and through the Global Education Coalition that UNESCO launched together with partners. And today we have around 200 partners and we are operating in more than 100 countries.
I think that uh, there are uh, several aspects that uh, uh, our, for example, Futures of Education report has highlighted. First uh, is we need a new social contract for education, that we need to agree on what uh, place we would like to give to education in our societies, in our economies, in the sustainable development path that we are building. Second, we need to act on some dimensions of the education aspect. One is the curriculum. How are we embedding into the curriculum uh, new dimensions like uh, attitude toward uh, each other, like uh, education for sustainable development, like global citizenship? And there is also the importance given to schools. Uh, obviously, the crisis showed us that we need schools. We need more schools, but not the same school that we are having today. A new modality of organizing the teaching and learning, a new modality of governing schools, and a new modality of organizing remote learning and in presence learning. And that's about hybrid learning, for example. And the last, which is related to, the fir to, the, uh, to this one, is how we connect the different learning spaces. We learn online, we learn at home, we learn in community, we learn in school. But we need to organize this learning so that it is valued. It is valorized by society, it is valorized by uh, economy, and it's valorized for individuals themselves. We never uh, put it in this way. And I think connecting learning spaces, valorizing the learning that is happening in different spaces will be something that we will have to take forward. Let me mention uh, a happy school initiative that we started implementing in Asia Pacific and now we are putting at the global level. The, the, the purpose of the happy school is that uh, we come to school not only to learn, but also to thrive, to uh, be uh, in a better uh, well-being, but also to connect with communities. And the Happy School is an initiative that connects the school with the community. For example, working with elders uh, or engaging with elders in Japan. For example, working on sustainable development in, in Thailand or uh, working within the school to create uh, different cultural activities in, in, uh, in Laos. So these are some of the examples that I think we'll have to take forward at scale. We'll have to take forward in terms of considering school not only a place of learning, but it's also a place of engaging together. It's a place of better health, better nutrition, but also better well-being. And that's about happiness. So what we have been doing with the countries like uh, Madagascar is to develop new modalities of recognizing learning happening in the workplace, in communities, and in vocational training centers. And this is very important today if we take forward this perspective of we learn from early learning to adult learning. That's the lifelong learning perspective. And the neurosciences shows us that we start uh, learning very early and that our further learning is predetermined already in early learning. The history of education is, of course, uh, very long. And uh, since UNESCO uh, was uh, engaged in education, we started with this principle that uh, peace is built in the minds of people. And that meant we need to improve education. We need to develop education. Since 1945, we have been acting to uh, promote education. But uh, of course, there is an, an, a trend and an evolution. To give you an example, in 1960, half of the children in the world were not accessing to education. That's how we established the right to education. And it was very important to say that every children has to go to school. Since then, we have uh, achieved much. Uh, in 1990, we have adopted the, uh, the Jomtien Declaration. In 2000, we have adopted the Education for All. In 2015, we have adopted the SDGs and SDG4. So the path has been long, and UNESCO has been the organization that advanced rights in different uh, areas, in particular in education. Learning is cumulative. It starts at very early ages and it continue till uh, adult learning. Let me give a very concrete example. The Republic of Korea in early 60s was devastated. It was uh, at the level of economic development as uh, sub-Saharan African countries at that time. Today, it's a high income country. It's one of the countries that have uh, adapted and adopted technology at the highest level. It is mainstreamed in different parts of the economy, society, and in the education system. Since the 1960s, the Republic of Korea has been investing in education, and UNESCO supported them since the beginning by printing just something like textbooks and helping them in looking at how their education system can develop toward a, a better and more inclusive a, a, a learning for everybody. We see the result. 
they have invested in education and they are uh, they have developed it not only from an economic point of view, but also from a social point of view, from equity and inclusion point of view. And it's very important to say that even when countries are poor, if they prioritize education, this can yield result. Integrating uh, education for sustainable development in the curricula and in the school system uh, is a, a very important uh, vector for action for all member states. We found that very little is in integrated in teacher training. But obviously, if we want to uh, ensure that education for sustainable development is integrated within education, we need at least three ingredients. Curriculum, teachers, and school-based uh, approach. And that's what you have seen, for example, in a country like China, where there were 100,000 schools who have integrated education for sustainable development in, in their program, but also in the organization of the schools. We have seen in Kenya, where there are schools that have an, implemented also uh, this approach and they have been working in how they can embed education for sustainable development, not only in the curricula, but also in the learning space in the school premises, in the garden, in the different, uh, in the classroom. So it's very important that we take those different dimensions, but is, we also act for capacity building, for building institutions that can advance the education agenda in the countries. And that's how we are operating through a program called Cap Capacity Building for Education 2030. The objective of the program is to build national institutions so that uh, the programs and, and the education is inclusive, is quality. The way we do it is we develop the capacity of the stakeholders, of decision makers, and we support in creating or reinforcing institutions that uh, are active in education. For example, teacher training institution. And the objective is always how we can create capacities that are sustainable, that are viable at the country level. So that uh, at the end, there is a, a homegrown capacities for policy making, for policy uh, implementation, and for policy evaluation monitoring. The objective of any capacity building is to uh, give the autonomy and the capabilities at country level. It's basically helping countries to help themselves. And I think that's what UNESCO has been doing through uh, this program for capacity building, is creating institutions that are able to develop programs, that are able to develop quality programs. And that's what, uh, where we can take the countries from one stage of development of their education system to a new stage which is a stage of quality, inclusive, and lifelong learning opportunities for all. We are all lifelong learners. And in two years of activities, including through the Global Education Coalition, I have learned much. First, I have learned how to leverage the, the capacities of private sector, for example. I didn't know this, and I, have, I had to learn how to engage with them. I have learned that uh, how we can build uh, resilience of our staff to uh, respond to the crisis, to work in a teleworking, but also to keep their socio-emotional well-being. I've also learned that the international cooperation and solidarity is not a rhetoric. It can be a reality. And that's what we have been uh, engaging in in the last two years. And I'm a lifelong learner. As a director of a division for lifelong learning, I have to learn every day. And I'm learning together with my colleagues, together with my um, uh, partners. And uh, this is something that has to be, I would say, uh, a value for all of us. It's a value. Learning for life, learning in lifelong learning is a value. And we have to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm.